patient hearing and I'm very uh, 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 So uh, 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 I hope uh, that uh, you can see my slides okay. Uh, I don't know, it's jumped from the first slide. I, let me try to go back to the first slide. Okay, so, uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, other people have talked about the link of cardiovascular events in relation to some of the other treatments uh, in diabetes. Uh, and uh, yes, that is certainly a factor. And I think an important factor in the reduction in the risk of cardiovascular disease with some of the newer drugs. But having said that, uh, we still often have to use insulin in people with type 2 diabetes, and that does increase the risk of hypoglycemia, as you know. Surprisingly, we've known for many years hypoglycemia causes a lot of distress and difficulties for patients, uh, but the risk associated with cardiovascular disease has only recently been appreciated in the last 10 or 15 years. And I'll show you some of that data in a moment. Uh, First of all, let me define what we're talking about with hypoglycemia. There are many definitions about it. This is the most recent from the ADA, which call, gives levels, level one hypoglycemia being less than 70. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is that you often get and set to get an alert on CGM, et cetera, is that this is the threshold for activation of counter-regulatory hormones, such as adrenaline and glucagon, etc. So the body is sensing that something is going wrong. And as we will discuss later on, this uh, counter-regulation is involved with some of the pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease. The second issue is the cognitive impairment, and uh, that can occur at different levels in different people, but they've set a level of 54 uh, uh, because it's three millimoles per liter and level three is classified as a severe event involving altered me uh, mental status uh, and requiring a, uh, treatment. There are some previous definitions that I think are a little bit more descriptive and it may be important, particularly defining severe as needing the assistance of another person. There's another uh, uh, category, which I think is fairly frequent and that when people have probable symptoms of hypoglycemia, but they don't measure it. So uh, do we not classify those as hypoglycemia? I think we should, at least in clinical practice, maybe not in, in research-related things. So hypoglycemia, at whatever level, has a lot of impacts on the, on the patient. It affects quality of life, work productivity. Uh, there are a number of studies showing these. But the, the importance is that it, leads to changes in patients' behavior, different uses of uh, uh, mal maladaptation to this in behavioral terms of not uh, titrating their dose, overeating, more weight gain, and increased cost. But the real problem we're addressing today is the increased morbidity and mortality, particularly cardiovascular disease, but overall mortality also being associated with this. So this is an old paper, one of the early ones to uh, point out that hypoglycemia is very common in, in type 1 diabetes and is also common in type 2, but it's less frequent than in type 1. So here is a more uh, recent paper, uh, more generalized population in the U.S., uh, talking about how often people get uh, hypoglycemia. And in type 1, as you can see, it is very, very frequent occurring uh, of in 60% of people at least once a week, uh, or may, maybe more often, and in type 2, almost 25%. And now with continuous glucose monitoring, we're recognizing that asymptomatic hypoglycemia down to levels below 50 are occurring quite often. And some of this occurring at night uh, or uh, when the patient is somewhat vulnerable and, and uh, events occur, and uh, we, we are using more and more of continuous glucose monitoring to recognize this phenomenon. And here is one uh, study showing, this is an early CGM study showing this is fairly frequent, uh, uh, just like with the, with the other ones, but maybe more frequent in type 2 diabetes. Now, uh, people who have a lot of fluctuations in their blood glucose uh, due to uh, treatment that's not right or uh, uh, 
behavioral factors tend to get more hypoglycemia. And that's not also surprising. If you're going to be fluctuating up and down a lot, you might overshoot and get hypoglycemia. The big problem is people are often unaware of their hypoglycemia. And this is very common in type one diabetes, but increasingly happens in older people with type two, particularly if they have neuropathy. We also recognize that there are many risk factors for hypoglycemia. Long duration, as I mentioned, cognitive impairment itself can induce hypoglycemia, neuropathy because you don't recognize it, and other comorbidities, particularly hepatic and renal dysfunction. So sometimes there are self-management issues, medication overdose, uh, taking prandial insulin and not having meals, exercise that's unusual uh, at an odd time of the day without adequate nutrition, et cetera. So many years ago, we were among the first to describe a very interesting phenomenon uh, that looked at people who had started insulin therapy in the VA population and had an episode of cardiovascular, uh, I'm sorry, an episode of hypoglycemia within the first three months. And then we tracked that and compared them with a control group who also started insulin, but did not get hypoglycemia in the first three months. And here, what you see is that the, those who had hypoglycemia had more cardiovascular events. Now, is this due to hypoglycemia or just a marker that these people have comorbidities and other problems is not clear, but I think it is the latter. But it's very clear you're identifying a marker of future risk of cardiovascular rate. Big difference in, in, in rates of these events, particularly over the two to three year uh, period. And a lot more seems to occur in people with known cardiovascular disease, as you can see from this study. Now, whether this is because these people are sicker with other comorbidities is also not clear uh, from, from this uh, uh, population. Clearly, uh, renal insufficiency uh, and other comorbidities make it difficult for people uh, to uh, manage their diabetes well, and they also tend to have more hypoglycemia. Now, uh, there's an increased risk in people with, uh, uh, you know, people who have coded for hypoglycemic events. They also have very frequently increased risk of cardiovascular events, coding sometimes 10 times more. By coding, I mean uh, documentation of both the diagnosis of hypoglycemia and a cardiovascular event. So here is another study uh, fr from uh, the Scottish group, Dr. Freya et al., who've done a lot of work in this area. And they looked at cardiovascular events in type 1 diabetes. And in people who have had more than one previous episode, they have their risk is 1.9. And in people with type 2 diabetes, it is 1.5. Uh, perhaps uh, there are other factors in people with type 2 diabetes, such as age and, and obesity, et cetera. Uh, this problem really came to the forefront with, with the ACCORD trial, where uh, the trial, as you know, intensive therapy was stopped early because of an increase in mortality. Uh, and uh, in, it occurred actually in both groups, the standard group and the intensive group. And I'll go back into that breakdown. But it was associated in, in this occurred more in people who had prior hypoglycemia. So they were dying more, more frequently. Uh, the origin trial was another insulin trial. And they too also noted that there was an increased risk of uh, mortality, although the mortality rates were much, much lower uh, in people who had had hypoglycemia. Uh, as you are aware, there are other studies such as the advanced study, the VADT, these were all done in, at the same time in different populations, and they all showed the same thing of increased mortality being associated with hypoglycemia. Uh, now the question is, are these people actually dying from hypoglycemia? And the answer is no. They're not immediately dying from hypoglycemia where the blood sugar is dropping just too low and the patient doesn't recover. Some of those uh, increased deaths and events are occurring two to three years later. Now that raises the question is why is that happening? What is hypoglycemia doing? And we'll talk to, about some of the mechanisms later on, but the uh, I, I think an important uh, issue in relation to this is that Hypoglycemia is a marker, and it may tell you your patient's ability to recover before the glucose drops below 70, such as renal impairment, uh, impaired hepatic uh, and renal gluconeogenesis, et cetera, 
are contributing to their uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, and, and it's just a marker there. And uh, here's a, a meta-analysis of all these cardiovascular outcome trials that I pointed out to you. Those are at least randomized trials, but there's also a number of observational studies and uh, uh, retrospective studies, non-randomized population-based, very large numbers showing ex very much the same thing. So this meta-analysis is important, although it's mixing the two groups, which I don't particularly like, but it's got almost a million people with at least one to five years of follow-up. Let me just go back to the ACCORD trial because we learned a lot of lessons there. If you look at hypoglycemia rate, it is obviously much, much more in the intensive treatment group than in the standard group. Remember, our aim for intensive treatment was to get the A1C below 6%, and I think nobody's really chasing that anymore uh, with insulin. Maybe if you achieve that with some of the newer drugs, that's great. We also identified other factors involved in, in uh, hypoglycemia, such as renal disease, uh, African-Americans, more in women, more as you get older, but high BMI with obesity being protective, maybe because these people have better body stores of nutrition. There are obviously patient-related factors, such as delayed meals, et, et cetera. That's not surprising, but it's not surprising in this population as well. What is uh, interesting is that the risk of hypoglycemia uh, uh, didn't just occur in people who were well controlled. In fact, there were a lot of people who tolerated A1Cs of six very well. It was the people between eight and nine in both the intensive and standard group who had more hypoglycemia because we were trying too hard and they were maybe sometimes not taking their insulin so the A1C was high and then they took too much and went low. And if you look, break it down into groups, and I won't spend much time on this, uh, it occurred more in people who uh, uh, mortality was higher in people in the standard group who had hypoglycemia. So it, I think it's very tragic that people have A1Cs of 8% and have hypoglycemia. That is another population at increased risk, a risk of, of, of uh, uh, mortality. So it's counterintuitive, but although intensive control uh, it does increase the risk of hypoglycemia. Poor glycemic control also has a great risk of hypoglycemia, irrespective of what treatment uh, you use. Now, as Dr. Now pointed out, this all changed when we started using GLP-1 receptor agonists. And you've seen the cardiovascular outcome trials. And in, clearly in the GLP-1 and SGLT-2 treated groups, the hypoglycemia uh, events are less. Now, does that mean that that is the mechanism? I don't think it's the only one, but certainly may contribute. The same thing is seen uh, in people with who are inpatients. So I want to point, I spend the next few slides talking about inpatient hypoglycemia, where the responses and the severity and the problems are, and the end result is very similar to what happens with hypoglycemia. We all say hypoglycemia in hospitalized patients is bad, but so is hypoglycemia because you get aggravation of ischemia and adrenergic responses and more oxidative stress, et cetera. So many early studies, particularly from cardiac uh, patients, showed an increase in mortality in those whose lowest blood glucose in the hospital was less than three millimoles, uh, almost doubling. So the relationship between blood glucose and death from myocardial infarction is actually J-shaped. The higher you have a, uh, your glucose, the greater the mortality, but the mortality is very greatly risk increased in people who have low blood sugars. Here's another uh, way of looking at the same thing with another study. So what's the mechanism? And a number of mechanisms have been proposed. I'm gonna show you some data in a moment. Uh, they uh, they propose showed QT interval prolongation, decreased perfusion, uh, endothelial dysfunction, increased coagulation, and uh, uh, et cetera. But before we go there, let's lo look at the physiological response to hypoglycemia. The first thing that happens when your glucose drops below 80, actually in a normal person, the first line of defense is to decrease insulin secretion. Now you cannot do that when you've already injected insulin or you've taken a sulfonylurea. You can do that with GLP-1 receptor agonist because that is this uh, action and uh, is glucose dependent. The second is an increase in glucagon. Then in, and around the same time, an increase in adrenaline. 
You get other uh, uh, responses later on with rise in cortisol, etc., and you start feeling hungry as it drops even further. But this is really the point we need to focus on: are these things contributing uh, to the to the events? Also, the brain may adapt to these changes, so brain function is changing, uh, and you get further changes in autonomic function, which might be important in regulation of cardiac function. And I'll elaborate on that in a moment. So here are some studies that have been done uh, uh, looking at uh, the hypoglycemia and, and inflammation. So you, they did clamp studies, uh, keeping people either euglycemic or hypoglycemic, uh, and they looked at adrenaline increase and uh, uh, that was very clear, but when they looked at markers of inflammation, such as selectin uh, and uh, uh, markers uh, like PMA, et cetera, they are clearly going up during hypoglycemia. Here is a study specifically done in uh, normal controls and in type 1 diabetes. And you see the similar kind of things happening during hypoglycemia, that you are getting an increase in uh, adhesion molecules like VCAM, selectin, Pi-1, which is uh, uh, involved in the fibrinolysis process, and uh, inflammatory agent IL-6 going up. Now, this goes up in both normal individuals as well as in people with diabetes. So it is not something related to diabetes. It is related to hypoglycemia. Also, cardiovascular, this is a test of autonomic function. Uh, uh, they are very good predictors of uh, re reflex tests and, and uh, tests of uh, autonomic function and its regulation of uh, uh, endothelial function, and they're good predictors of mortality. And here's what happens when you, you uh, have hypoglycemia. Your autonomic function is impaired. Uh, when you have uh, a pre little earlier had hypoglycemia, you're unable to, to change your bar baroreflex uh, 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 sensitivity, and your output of sympathetic boost frequencies are, are, are altered. Uh, and this is a, yeah, another study pointing out the same thing. And uh, you have an impairment in the longer term sympathetic and nor, uh, norepinephrine responses, but uh, you can still get the burst at times at a, uh, 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 that might lead to hypoglycemia. We did a study very early in 2002 when, we, when CGM first came out doing Holter monitoring and, uh, uh, and uh, glucose monitoring simultaneously. And we found in this population about 54 episodes of hypoglycemia, 10 of which were associated with chest pain. These were people with known uh, cardiovascular disease, mainly type 2 diabetes. And six of them had ECG abnormalities. And some of them were symptomatic, some were asymptomatic. We also noticed a little bit of such events in people who had hyperglycemia, but it was a lot, lot less. What was interesting was people who had rapid changes in their glucose, dropping by around 100, not necessarily dropping below 70. So say you go from 200 to 100, you had a greater risk of having chest pain and ECG abnormalities suggesting that this can be uh, uh, just fluctuation in blood glucose and a drop can, can change it. And here is a, a, a one a recording. This is a single case of uh, 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 cerebrovascular disease, and he had uh, simultaneous Holter and glucose monitoring. And you see here, he has hypoglycemia during the night, and around the time of that, if you if you go into more detail on his whole toy, you see the start of ventricular tachycardia, just three beats. But uh, if that hypoglycemia had continued longer, it's possible that he may have gone into uh, prolonged ventricular tachycardia. So ventricular arrhythmias have been shown in other studies to be more frequent in, uh, in people who have hyper severe hypoglycemia, particularly in people with type 2 diabetes and, and CVD. It's very hard to document ventricular tachycardia, but triplets are, are almost a, you know, likely to be a precursor to uh, going over and progressing to ventricular tachycardia at some point. Here's a study looking at the QT interval, the corrected QT interval uh, being prolonged during hypoglycemia, and then during recovery, uh, it comes back down. 
Uh, there are other EKG changes that are described, amplification of the R wave, uh, decrease in the uh, ST segment, flattening of the T wave, all have been described in a variety of, uh, 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 of papers. And we summarized all this in a review article, uh, Cyrus D'Souza and myself, uh, showing the wide range of things that go wrong with hypoglycemia. Decreased vasodilatation, increased inflammation, platelet activation, coagulation, and rhythm abnormalities, as I have shown you. So what do we do for patients? Let's get to something more practical. First of all, uh, I pointed out the factors that uh, make your patient at risk. So we need to assess patients' risk for hypoglycemia. We need to determine whether they have hypoglycemia or not. Now, that's a very hard thing to do unless you test more often, but today with even with professional CGM, blinded professional CGM for a couple of weeks, you'll be able to know whether your patient uh, is getting asymptomatic uh, uh, hypoglycemia and therefore hypoglycemia on awareness. And just raising the glucose targets and the A1C targets may help overcome hypoglycemia awareness in some people. Also, any neurological symptoms uh, are, 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 are suspect and neuropathy obviously is more commonly associated with this. And then there are strategies to prevent hypoglycemia. There are recommendations from ACE to do more frequent monitoring, use more flexible insulin regimens, and uh, provide some ongoing guidance and support to your patients. The uh, ADA also has uh, similar recommendations, avoiding aggressive targets, uh, adding carbohydrates before exercise, and, and also limiting uh, uh, alcohol intake. When a, we should educate all our patients to treat hypoglycemia promptly. The 15-15 rule is check your blood sugar, eat 15 grams of carbohydrate, and wait 15 minutes and then check it again. And if it isn't right, repeat this whole process. Now, what has really changed uh, our, our management of hypoglycemia and led to prevention of hypoglycemia as well with a lower A1C is continuous glucose monitoring. And here's a, sum, a, a summary of some of those uh, uh, studies in, in type 1 uh, uh, showing a, a reduction in hypoglycemia rates uh, in people with both high A1C and low A1C. And, and this has really been a game changer in, in this respect. Uh, there are also better treatments. Previously, you had to draw up the glucagon. There are now pens that are available, uh, ready to inject. For, you know, some of them do require uh, refrigeration, uh, but there are now newer uh, uh, pens that are available that are pre-filled liquid gl gl glucagon. You don't need to mix it. Uh, it's a pre-filled syringe with an auto-injector, so very easy to use. And now you have a nasal powder for single use. This is very rapidly absorbed. You can take it during suspicion of hypoglycemia if you don't have time to test. And in fact, it, even in an unconscious patient, it can be administered by a relative. So it is more expensive, but we are uh, using this in a number of people and found it to be very, very useful. And another form of glucagon called DASI glucagon uh, has been developed, which is water soluble, which might allow this to be used in dual chamber pumps, the true artificial pancreas. So that is on, the, on its way. So in summary, hypoglycemia, both mild and severe, is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events and mortality and should be avoided when possible. We should, uh, obviously try to use more in, uh, of the agents that don't cause hypoglycemia in cardiovascular patients, but inevitably some people will need insulin. Uh, they impact quality of life. It, uh, it, it may be a barrier to reaching goals that we want. It's a clear predictor of events. So you treat those as high-risk patients. People get hypoglycemia. Be more aggressive with their lipids and blood pressure. Uh, and uh, maybe avoid future hypoglycemia. So the underlying mechanisms are unclear, but there are some that have been identified, and maybe we should be addressing those as well. So I'll stop there and be happy to take questions.